My name is Pete Woodcock. I'm a lecturer in politics and head of criminology, politics and sociology here at the University of Huddersfield. And I'm doing the Dimblery right role and I'm chairing uh, the event today. I, I think politics uh, is, has disengaged with young people and young people are disengaged with politics and the two are, are heavily linked. You know, a number of the people that come here today, of course, are exceptions that prove the rule, you know, people who are really interested. But, you know, if you scour through party manifestos in a forthcoming election, see how many policies are to do specifically with young people and be uh, very small. And it becomes a vicious circle. Young people aren't interested in politics, therefore the political parties don't pay much attention and therefore young people get even less interested in politics. Hopefully events like this and, and, and the members of the panel who have come to speak to people today will help move us in the right direction. I'm Jason McCartney, I'm the Conservative Member of Parliament for Colm Valley. Well this is the first of uh, many hustings that have been arranged as we head towards the general election. Uh, I can see already that St Paul's Hall here is going to be pretty full, which is a great sign, and there's lots of young people here as well. And uh, I'm very, very keen on engaging with young people, getting young people interested in, in politics. So I'm looking forward to a good range of questions and a really good, positive debate. Yep, my name's Richard Carter, leader of Yorkshire First. From, from our point of view, uh, this election's about name awareness, making sure that people know that there are other options out there. We're standing a lot of candidates for the first time, up to 16 seats. And for us, it's about, as we say, getting our name out there and being able to interact with the public. Uh, and that clearly is very important. Uh, my name is Robert Butler. Uh, everybody calls me Rob, and I'm representing the UKIP. Um, I think it's really important that young people participate in the democratic process. I think too many young people have become voluntary disenfranchised and so what I'd really like to do is to put forward the UKIP case and to encourage young people to participate and vote in the general election. I hope that um, the growth of Web 2.0 applications helps the interest of young people in politics. I hope things like debates around lowering the voting age in 16 in Scotland helps getting them engaged. I've seen no statistics that prove that young people are getting more engaged but I hope that's not the case. I hope people are, and I, I hope that in the come out election that we buck that trend. It, it is difficult. Uh, the times move on, and it's difficult. So the bottom line is, what we're trying to do, we've got quite a lot of young people involved in ours, and some of our key players are actually uh, recently graduated. So we think that we've got our fingers on the, the pulse in some ways with the youth. But at the end of the day, I'm a 49 year old, it's going to be very difficult in that sense to uh, relate to them in that, in that way. Well I, well, I certainly remember five years ago going and doing lots of hustings events and I actually remember that most of the people that were in the audience were retired because they actually have the spare time to do it. Um, so it's great to do something a little bit earlier in the evening at tea time uh, and get and do it at the university as well. I can't remember doing one at the university five years ago. We did do a hustings at New College and I've done various events at Greenhead College in the past few years as well. So it's a great venue. It's great to see so many young people here as well. And hopefully we can just be open and honest, have a really good debate um, and, and people get a lot of good information out of it. I think that we need to address the facts sensibly uh, in an honest and open way. And I think young people respond to that. I, you know, if you, uh, certainly if you try and dumb it down, then that by definition is patronising. You just have to say it as it is. Yeah, well, I think people are, are pretty excited about it, you know, because the thing is, is that it's been the phony war up to this point. There's been talk about the general election. We all know that the general election's coming up, but uh, there's a feeling now that with the debates on television kicking off and this, that they, we're, we're starting to move before until the actual general election. So in, in that sense, there's a bit of excitement about it amongst the politics students here at least. Uh, I think one of the major ones would be the, um, the fact that for STEM subjects and for medical subjects, we would actually uh, remove all tuition fees. Uh, I personally believe that tuition fees are little more than a, a the tuition fees are little more than a mis-selling scandal and an absolute disgrace. And uh, many of the young people that t embark on uh, uh, courses that require fees and, and loans will end up being little more than indentured servants for many years to come. Well, I, I think for me, the biggest worry is that 28,000, I think that's the, the right figure, graduates are lost to the southeast each year from this region. 
Now for me, when students uh, go to uh, school here, go to college here, go to university, we've got to have a, a, an economy, we've got to have a, a Yorkshire that works for them and gives them the opportunities so that we can retain more of those here and build a stronger future for, for the region. Well, I'm a caring, compassionate conservative. I care about our area, I care about Yorkshire. I want to get people into good jobs, good careers, because I think that's the basis of life. If you've got a good job, you're getting some money in your pocket, you can get somewhere nice to live, have a nice car, have a nice holiday, and you're then paying taxes, which pays for the NHS, good schools for your children when you eventually might go on and have children, pays for the upkeep of the roads and for our local hospitals. So that's, that's the building block of life really. Uh, and if we can get that right, we can make sure that everyone here in Huddersfield and Con Valley uh, has a good standard of living. I think it's great. I think we're all, uh, all part of the Melba. Uh, I think uh, the more that we uh, do to encourage young people to participate in an environment which they're familiar with, the better it is. Well done. You've put the event on. Um, we need more of these. Well, I'm a huge fan of Huddersfield University. My dad actually worked here for 10 years uh, on the business school. Um, and I really admire everything that Bob Cryan and Sir Patrick Stewart has, has achieved for our town. Um, I'm always mentioning the university in the Houses of Parliament. I'm very proud of the students here, the staff, the new buildings. It, it's wonderful. I only wish I was 20 years younger and I could come and study here myself. Um, and, and I think it's wonderful that the university has put on tonight's hustings in this amazing venue. Universities are in the hearts of towns and cities around the country. We should be playing our civic role in getting people on uh, campus uh, from the wider citizenry, mixing them up with our students and talking about debates as grown adults. So I think hopefully this event is going to be kicking off that to make sure that people in Huddersfield realise that this is their university and we use this as an opportunity to give people an opportunity to speak to one another and you know that's ultimately for me what a university should be doing. Chris Bonabar, excellent next politics uh, graduate, so I should, should point out the press. Um, international students were central to the reason why this university became the university of the uh, I'm curious as to what the panel that I still, I used to work as a university teacher uh, before I became an MP um, and uh, I um, am a gatherer of the London School of Economics and a visiting professor both in London, UCL and uh, here in Huddersfield. And uh, I know just how much this higher education system it depends on international students. And I also know what an amazing um, experience it brings to all the students who study, you know, from all parts of the world, mixing together, learning from each other. I think it's wonderful. Every, you know, in Huddersfield, uh, in London, uh, everywhere I go visiting universities, I know that that mix is amazing. And I start with that because the cynical people will say, yes, a 10 or 12 percent of higher education income comes from foreign students. A lot more than that in the London School of Economics, I can tell you. But the fact of the matter is, yes, there is, we are in the international market for higher education, and we're bloody good at it. And long may we continue to be uh, that good. But I tell you, there is a kind of feeling, and I know that uh, you have got this you know, passion about immigration, and it's about immigration and Europe, and you know, this is the first hustings that we've really done together, and I suppose I'm going to have to put up with hearing it for a long time. But the fact of the matter is, I celebrate the people that come here. I celebrate the people that come to our country and help us make it as even more successful and richer than we would be otherwise. I celebrate the fact that people seeking the good life in many countries will end up coming here because it is a democratic society, it's a free society, and it's a society and a country of opportunity. Not only for the people who live here, but the people who come with their talents and honestly want to do the, to seek the good life in our country. And I, you know, I, I came, as I said in my answer to the first question, people, people have every right to pursue the good life. 
And that means better than my, you know, my, my family. 200 years ago, persecuted by the Catholics, as Huguenots, you know, as, as uh, non-conformist uh, uh, Christians in, in France, and fled France, otherwise they'd been killed. And they went all over the world. So I know, in my heritage, in my blood, I'm a migrant, and I'm not going to start having this listening to rubbish that we get from this party that is, you know, a, a, a thinly disguised racist party. Thinly disguised BNP, I have to say. Thinly disguised. We know what you can stand for. And today, I have to tell you, I will continually say that I, dis I dislike their views, I dislike their attitude to foreign students, I dislike their attitude to the whole question of migration, and I don't like the attitude to the European Union, which is, is absolutely, in my lifetime, has secured peace and prosperity for our European nations. And I will stick to that, and every time I hear the, this UKIP poison, I will nail it for what it is. Um, just, just, just ridiculous. Uh, we are not a racist party. Um, I'm, fact, I'm not going to defend. I'm not going to defend it. There are no racist policies at all in the UK. Um, this is about space, not race. However, with regard to international students, I think it's great. I think they are um, a huge benefit to our education. Uh, in fact, when I went to university in the 1970s, um, I shared a flat with an East African Asian called Sukhir. I used to play hockey with the Indian Society. I was the only white lad in the shower. I used to take the mick out of me because they said they couldn't see me against the white tires. <laughs> and it was, it was a fantastic, it was a fantastic experience. It was, it was a great experience. Um, I think so it, my best oh, for goodness sake! It's not, it's not. A, but I do think is that our experience, the experience at university, is enriched by international students, and I think. <coughs> I think the fact that they come here and uh, take advantage of the, the fantastic facilities and they work hard and, and, and that's all good stuff and I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, I think that uh, it is important that uh, we continue to increase that. It's a great source of foreign evidence so I have no problem at all with that experience. I don't understand um, why there is this myth that, uh, that uh, you could be racist. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Actually. It's, it's, a, it's a bit like saying, why is the why is the co-op? Uh, I understand that the chair of the co-op bank was a paedophile, but that doesn't mean to say that anybody that works with a co-op is a paedophile, uh, or oh, indeed represents. Okay, it's, that's what my understanding. Okay, so, so, so there you go. It just it really annoys me. Okay, that to uh, we get this, this smear. It's a false allegation. We are the only party that actually has if anyone has been a member of BNP or the EDL. Uh, if they have been a member in the past, they're not allowed to join our party. Although, again, I understand that there are or have been maybe councillors that were members of the BNP. Uh, I mean, you know, it was Nigel Farage's agent, he was a member of the BNP. For 40 years, he was a member of the Conservative Party. Okay, so That's I didn't right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, anyway, so uh, with to add to your question, International students are to be welcome. Okay, they have a huge amount to add to our economy and to the experience of the young people here in the business. Will you want to come back to this? Um, yeah. Or me personally? Yeah, please. Okay. I found it out. What I'd really like to do is to 
people to actually read what we have to say rather than listen to what our opponents say that we say. Um, and frankly, yeah, you're right. I mean, we have got a battle. You know, we are up against um, a ruling, I believe, a sort of like a, a, a metropolitan elite, of which we've got two very able members here, okay, uh, um, and, and a mainstream media that are, come from that same metropolitan elite. Uh, listen to what we listen to what we say. Don't listen to what our opponents say. We say, and I think you'll be surprised. And hopefully, that will change people's minds during this campaign. Thank you. International students, without doubt, are essentially they're the ones uh, properly <coughs> funding uh, higher education in, in this country in many ways. But I think that this is also a massive economic benefit, not just the social and cultural ones. When these people come over here, they learn about us, they, they meet people, they make connections, then they go back to wherever they go back to. Uh, that's a connection there. When, you, when people have a connection with a place, you are more likely when you're looking for something in the international market to go back to where you know. And I think it's, it's a key part of how we should move forward. The English language is the first language that everybody in the world seems to, to uh, learn. I moved to uh, Norway six years ago. It took me five years to learn Norwegian because they all speak perfect. English and it was very difficult to, to, to uh, pick it up. The point I'm making is that, that we have to capitalise on some of our strengths and the English language is one and, if, and, and because of our background in education it is a key asset for the country and as far as I'm concerned it, it links very well with the previous one. We have to be preparing all our uh, children and future citizens uh, uh, with the right skills to succeed and international students are an absolutely critical part of that. Can I answer uh, a little bit on, on the racist charge uh, uh, for, for the party next time? We've uh, recently had quite a number of uh, UKIP members defect to Yorkshire First, and I too was very, very fearful of the kind of people when I was asked to go over and speak to them in full. I, I had a lot of preconceptions. And through very many conversations, what I found was they are ordinary, everyday people that are very, very annoyed, very, very angry that they are not being listened to. Some of those people that, that came uh, across to us, one or two of them did say they didn't like the right wing drift, and increasingly, this was their comment, increasingly racist attitudes from some people. But I have to say, they surprise me, and I, I do not have the fear of uh, people in UKIP in the way that I, I did have previously. That does not mean to say I don't think uh, uh, that, that I agree with them. I disagree with them on almost every aspect when it comes to immigration, uh, when it comes to uh, the Yorkshire region, which is apparently an EU's plot, where well, there was an EU plot hatched 1,139 years ago when the Yorkshire boundaries were set up. So, so from my point of view, it's got nothing to do with that. Uh, but when you look at some of their policies around local democracy, some of us could very much agree with them. So I actually think politics is about trying to find agreement, because I'm sure that if, if uh, a group of people get together and their objective is to find a solution, eventually you'll do it. And you only get that by making concessions and by finding agreement. But we've got a system that says, I've got to hate you, you've got to hate him. It, it's almost pathetic. And one year ago, I would never have thought that I'd be sat somewhere like this. And I find it quite amusing now to actually sit and, and be amongst uh, uh, things being thrown at either way. I think politics is about finding agreement and finding solutions. And I think all of them, and I know that they do, they, they work together when they're in there. But a lot of it sometimes seems to, they have to be for sure. And I think that's, it's worrying and it probably goes to the heart of why people aren't engaged in politics. I don't want to be engaged in politics when I, when I see some of the things that, that, that you see. And I imagine that's why not just younger people, but also older people are engaged in it. And the uh, non-voters are the biggest party, and we're getting a lot of support from non-voters too.
when we look at foreign students coming here to, to work, uh, I think one of the, the way we ought to look at it is uh, looking at our place in the world. Uh, we are, uh, by some measures, the sixth richest country in the world. Uh, and that places a responsibility on us uh, because we do have a good education system and some of the wealth that we have in this country actually comes as a result of the training relationships that we have with a lot of those countries abroad. So building up those relationships, having people come over here uh, and being involved, uh, I, I think that there's a real danger in being in an insular country. It's about the, in many ways, it's about the same argument about going out of the, get, getting out of the EU. If we become more of an insular country, uh, one which is not engaging with people, inviting people in, bringing them forward, uh, then that way we can get greater understanding between people. I think there's another responsibility that we have, and that is to poorer countries. Uh, I think uh, one of the aspects that I particularly liked about the thing uh, I've seen from the document you had was about bursaries for, for poorer countries. Uh, so we can have bursaries for people to come over, not, not your Chinas and these are the places where people will come with money, but also look at what we can do to encourage uh, students from poorer countries to come here, to, to grow that knowledge. I think that's very important. And following on from Andrew's point about providing and funding places for students from poorer countries, I would add to that from troubled countries. When I was in the Royal Air Force, I served on the no-fly zone over northern Iraq, and I spent time on the ground in places like Zako, Mosul, uh, Dahuk, and Erbil. And I returned a couple of years ago with a parliamentary group. And I was absolutely delighted to find that there is a Huddersfield University alumni office in Erbil, in Kurdistan, in northern Iraq. And following on from that visit, the students here at the University, the Kurdish students, got in touch with me. I've been regularly to meet them here at the University. There's nearly a hundred of them. They are fantastic. They've become friends. We keep in touch on Facebook. And do you know what? They are getting a great education here. They are spreading the word about Huddersfield University and they're not staying here, they're going back to Kurdistan with their training as mechanical engineers and lawyers and doctors and they're giving their troubled part of the world a fighting chance to survive and prosper and I'm really proud of the part that Huddersfield University has played with that. I don't have a surname, but I know it's 22. Are you? Are you 22, Alex? A microphone is, is coming your way uh, here to uh, in, in the middle of. Hi, uh, what are you going to do about large corporations that pay significantly less tax than they should? Who and I have picked on first yet? Uh, well, one of the things we need to do is get across countries to uh, work together on this uh, because there are, uh, right by the way, one of the problems is of course you, uh, you, you put a policy in place in one country and, uh, and they go across to another in fact as far as their tax affairs are concerned. Um, so yes we need to tackle it, yes we need to, uh, to, to uh, crack down on it and uh, we also need to crack down on tax issues like uh, for instance, the Mayfair loophole, which was in Parliament, which, uh, uh, which uh, Barry was going to talk about that for uh, a while. But yeah, it, but it requires international action, and that's one of the things that we should certainly be looking at at the European Union level, because obviously we've had the Luxembourg issues uh, there with uh, the LuxLeaks, with about uh, international corporations uh, using Luxembourg as a safe haven for tax. So yes, it requires international action, but the UK has got a lead uh, on this, and the UK has not been playing fair on this issue, and uh, it's, got a, it's, it's got a job to do. It's, it's almost like the UK is reluctant to tackle this, this as, a, as an area because of its links. Richard? 100% uh, uh, agree with, with that. We've got, basically, the, the future growth in jobs in this country is going to come predominantly from small businesses. But we've got an unfair playing field. Uh, Big corporations can, set, can change their citizenship, effectively. They can get out of paying tax. We can't. 
You know, our tax authorities will get to us wherever we are. But these big companies are essentially, they're not domiciled anywhere anymore, essentially. They can flit around and they can choose where they go, which is why international agreements are key. And it just it's another great example of where somewhere like the EU is highly appropriate for tackling some of those issues. As far as we're concerned with these things, you need to push as much responsibility and power down to the lowest possible level. But some things you need to deal with at different levels. And that's why we believe in a regional government, of course a national government, but also international governments, because companies play each, each country off against the other. So how will you actually go about doing that? I think the only way is that you've got to gain international agreements, but that has got to be used as an, as an excuse, which the current government appears to be doing. Oh, and we, sorry, we need full disclosure from these companies as well about their, their, their tax effects that can operate in these countries, in our country. So that, I mean, that's full disclosure from them is, is, is another thing that we need to look at. But I, th I think a more important one for, for small businesses, particularly in, in our, our region, are, are to look again at business rates. I, I think that, that is something that, that does appear to be a, a, a real issue for some, some smaller businesses, suffering from very unfair, in some ways, competition from the international companies. So I, I think that you have to tackle it from the international uh, angle, uh, as well as addressing the issues from a, the small business point of view. But it's about creating a level playing field. Thanks. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. We've talked about where we get money from to invest in our communities and these big corporations need to pay their fair share of tax. Something we can all do, as well as the government closing these loopholes, is we as consumers can actually make choices. And me and Mary have just been having the same conversation actually. I stopped going to Starbucks two years ago uh, and I made a choice. I haven't bought anything from Amazon for three years. I shop local. So if I need a, a gift for my daughters who are 11 and 9, I go to the Imagine Toy Shop in Hope Firth and support local shops. Um, I go to Taylor's Food Store, I did last night in Honley, which is a local company employing 20 people using local produce from Bolster Moor Farm Shop or Hinchliffe's Farm Shop. Um, I use Darkwoods Coffee, which is in Marsden, or, or Grumpy Mule, which is in Meltham, and Fair Trade as well. So the biggest way, as well as the government doing their bit and they're chasing after all these loopholes and trying to close them down, we as consumers can make a difference. So let's get out there and find where we're getting stuff on and make this happen. Come on, let's do it. That's the problem. That is the problem. The problem is the problem. Individuals, it's like the environment. Oh, turn your, turn your light bulbs on and that will help. Yes, it will. Of course yes. it will. Of course it will. But it's governments that have got responsibilities. And, and telling people, well, you make your choices. That's good it's as well. Can do it. Let's do it. You, you've got a, you've, you, you've got a responsibility. We've got we're politicians here, and we've got responsibilities to be able to do that. And it's not simply saying you go and do your own thing. It's as well as hey, these two. These two are obviously going to beat me as a referee all night. But uh, um, can I start by saying that I, I, I agree on the, yeah, who could against shopping local and supporting local yeah. businesses. This, this dreadful, uh, this dreadful um, uh, 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 poll that they do, analysis they've done that showed we have one of the sickest uh, high streets in the country because you know we're really being taken over by you know, all sorts of rubbishy uh, you know, pound stretches and all that sort of stuff and takeaways and so on. Um, that's very significant, and uh, it's lovely to have the French market. It's lovely to have the French market here this weekend. Uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing really brings our town to life. But let's go for the really big stuff here. The really big stuff is the most effective bit of propaganda that the Conservative government, really the coalition government, have used over this last five years is that the world economic meltdown was Labour's fault. Now, I only wish that the Labour Party and the Labour government was that powerful, Subjected. That, that, that powerful that could have started a world meltdown of the economy. Now, you and I know, in this instance, we all know that there was a world meltdown because of bent, crooked bankers worldwide. That's what caused it. 
We know what caused it. All the analysis, every respectable economist knows what caused the question, Barry. And I've got my question. And if you're going to deal, seriously deal with this question, I think it's absolutely right what Andrew started talking about. That you've got to take this on on a multinational basis. The fact of it is you've got to do it because these people will hide all over the world. These big corporations are moving their headquarters. They're moving their operations. They're moving their tax base all the time. They're cleverer than most governments in the world. So if we're going to really take this on, we've got to get serious. But I tell you, leaving the European Union won't help us do that at all. The European Union is probably one chance that you could actually have a number of agreements to stop the kind of swindling that these multinational corporations have done. And I tell you, some of the best friends, his best friends, and you know, we get on quite well in Parliament, but the truth is, some of his best friends, the hedge funds, the massive hedge funds, the bank of his party are the very part of the tax swindle of this whole country. About time, if you want to forget shopping local, start on the hedge funds because they've been ruining this country for years. Enterprises, that's where the future growth will come. And that's where the future growth will come. And what's happening with the EU, the EU has transmogrified into, frankly, growing capitalism. There's big, big multinationals can afford the lobbying which goes on in the EU. And, and as a consequence, small and medium private enterprises are very often shielded out. And the reason why a lot of the EU regulations are put in place are, in fact, to increase the barrier of entry to stop small businesses actually becoming large businesses. <laughs> And let me finish. And the point is, is that you've got a president of the European Union, Juncker, who actually, when he was Prime Minister of Luxembourg, actually made a speciality out of making that principality into a, into a tax into a tax haven for large multinationals. And lots of companies, lots of companies, moved their headquarters to Luxembourg to take that advantage. And also the multinationals. Again, the problem with it is it's not just about the tax. But I come on to that. Ford closed down a fine manufacturing plant in Southampton that made transit vans. 500 high skill manufacturing jobs were lost. That's the transit van that had it hard running around the country in you know, you know, being patronising to women. At the same time, okay, they used EU funds to open up that factory in Turkey. Now I'm sorry, okay, it's not just about paying tax, it's actually about having a, a playing field for ordinary working people who actually are being absolutely... I was going to use a vernacular there. That's not the right word. Thank you for not having yeah, said no, Okay. Uh, they just been... We are, we are... We've been... We've been taken from this <coughs> right? And all we need... The, the, the large multinationals are using it to uh, produce... To, as they raise family ventures, and it's got to stop. They need to pay their tax. It should be based on the sales tax. My own opinion should be based on the sales tax in it. But if, if we were out of time. I think we were out of time. It's like that. We're probably going to come to. Are we going to do We've got several more questions to get, and we're running out of time. And this one is a particularly important one, given the demographics of everybody here. And is there a Victoria White? Oh, oh, are you selling a big Pikachu? Are you selling a Victoria? We've got a camera here. Camera. Camera. Microphone. Why do so few women vote compared to men, and how do you encourage women to vote on this general election? Uh, I've got three daughters and a son, um, and uh, I think that one of the real challenges is given that the proud history of the suffragette movement in this country, that over a hundred years ago, fought 
um, to get the vote. You can believe that uh, it wasn't until the 1929 general election that women got the votes in our country on the same basis as men. So, uh, and from where I see, the, you know, the more people that I see in Parliament as, as women, the, the, the more civilised and better Parliament becomes. So, you know, we're still a long way from getting enough women um, in Parliament, in politics, uh, and voting in politics, you're quite right. We're also really about time we've got more women in top level jobs in big corporations, small corporations. I, I see some hopeful signs, you know, that um, yeah, more people are getting involved in politics, more people are standing for Parliament with uh, women. So I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist in this, but I have to tell you that I think there's a, still a there's still a deep prejudice against equal rights for women in this country. Many people you know, do not believe that women should be equal. And I think that we take it, you know, I would say for granted that women should be equal. And I, I think that we seem to have, I've moved in the House of Commons, uh, the suggestion that we have a, a, an Equality Act so everyone at school learns that women have the same rights as men. Yeah? Whatever country you come from, whatever religion you are, we're in this country, we believe in the equal equality of women. And something that I you know, hold dear. Now, in terms of getting more women into politics, let's face it, the, and uh, I'm going to have to give a UK a real bone to show here, I think British political parties are really old-fashioned and out of date. All of them. You know, even UK. We're all in an old-fashioned mode. And when my uh, colleague here from Parliament, um, J J Jason, just talked about um, uh, Starbucks, I tell you what, who put a quarter of a million people outside Starbucks? It wasn't any political party, it was 38 degrees using social media. And I think social media, you know, and using it well, is the secret of actually getting more and more women involved in the great decisions. So, lots to do. Don't let to be complacent. We need more women in Parliament. Do a, do a check. I'm a governor of the LSE. I discovered recently that only 22% of our, prof our professorial staff were women. I found that we only had one black professor. This is the LSE, supposed to be very progressive. How many women professors have you got? How many diverse ethnicity? professors that you've got. So don't let us be complacent right across about our society. I think we are on the cusp of a revolution where women start to play a full part in politics and society and it's high time it happened. It's not just about getting women to vote, it's about getting young people to. And, and Barry and I regularly get asked in the Houses of Parliament why do so few young people vote as well? And I know the statistics. Over the age of 65 at the last general election, 68% uh, of people voted. Yet 18 to 24 age group, and a lot of them women, only 40% voted. So as well as engaging with women, we need to engage with young people, and that's why we're so pleased that so many young people are here tonight. Somebody that isn't in the audience here tonight is a wonderful local lady called Jebba Wilson. Gemma has three young children. She has an incredibly busy life. Uh, she juggles her young children with campaigning. I encouraged her to get into local politics and she's standing for the Conservatives in Lindley Ward. I told her not to come here tonight so she could give, uh, spend some time with the kids, but then she's going out on the doorstep campaigning. Um, I told her a couple of weeks ago that when her election count is on the Friday afternoon with the parliamentary one the night before, I actually said I would almost get more satisfaction from seeing her succeed because she's so committed, she really cares about her community and I just admire the way that she engages with people of all ages, she works so, so hard and it's not just her, I encourage people like Donna Bellamy from Marston to become a local councillor, Beryl Smith who is a head teacher. Um, I have young women coming doing work experience with me. Flo last week, and someone just came up to me earlier and said, my sister did work experience with you and really enjoyed it down in Parliament. I have two daughters. I'm doing everything I can 
to get young women into politics. And, and look out for the name Gemma Wilson, because she's going to be doing some great things for Huddersfield in the future. Great question. Thank you. Um, well, part of it is uh, this weekend uh, going to uh, have our first birthday. Uh, I can uh, guarantee, or I'll tell you, that it's very, very difficult uh, to, to get women involved in any way, shape or form in politics. And I think it appeals at this moment in time to a particular kind of person. And if you've got, if you look at how Parliament seems to operate from the outside, I've never really been down there, it doesn't give a good advert for why the hell you should get involved in politics. Only 1% of men bother to join a political party now. That's why we don't have members. So we're trying to do things differently, but it is very tough to get women involved. And I think if you've got a system designed the way it is, you will fail to get enough women coming through. Because, from my experience, women just don't buy into that all that they seem to, to see. And I think you've got to change fundamentally the structures that we've got here. And until you do that, you're not really going to get up to that parity. But I think we've got parity issues in other ways. There are very, very few people that come from what I call ordinary working backgrounds. You know, most people have, have, and I think I'm right in saying it's over 50%, are ex-barristers or, or ex-legal profession. So we're electing the legal profession to make laws which then they go and make money out of by building all these little loopholes in, allowing the uh, companies to actually get through them. There is no separation of powers there. So for me, I think we've got to look again at how we organise the country to make it work for us. And if you do that, and if you take power out, out of the hands of politicians and put it more into the hands of people, allowing them to vote more in local referenda, and why not e-voting? Why not uh, lots of other ways of, of doing our politics differently? But I think you've got to do the politics differently, not just focus necessarily on getting more women to be more like the bad men that we've already got there, a completely different kind of politics. <coughs>
and saying uh, that 100% of our MPs uh, are women.
because our system was set up 200 years ago and it's failing us right now. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to let uh, market forces take, uh, take this in terms of uh, devolution. I think we've got a problem in the UK, and that is the fact that London is frankly a gravitational black hole as far as the economic and cultural concern is concerned. It actually draws far too many young people and far too many capital into it. However, an artificial construct like um, uh, Yorkshire First or the Northwest Regions, which is, I believe, part of a Euro uh, European strategy to dismember the UK. However, what I do think is that they should... No, 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 I said it was a strategy. Okay, however, I think that if we're going to counterbalance the poor of London, we need to look at, a frankly, a trans Pennine city. If you put Manchester and Leeds together, we can go as far as Liverpool will just call, and we develop the M62, we have a proper trans, uh, trans Pennine rail network, and we put in some, some super fast broadbands, then actually we've actually got us, we've actually got a conurbation. In fact, it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of an unusual conurbation, actually, because you end up with the suburbs in the middle, okay, sort of like the Pennines, and you've got the, you've got the industrial the commerce or the outskirts. But it would, I think that would be something that we should really seek to develop. Rather than trying to force fit a city the size of Leeds or a city the size of Manchester, which are, of course are significant cities, but they're not, they're still, they still would not be able to compete with the poor. London. But if you put those two together and actually started to actually create a proper, like Manchester specialised in media, <coughs> I mean, to be honest, uh, energy and drags, that's really 19th century, or certainly late, late 20th century. But I think Leeds is becoming, a, has always been, in fact, a financial power. I mean, certainly when the building from South around 30% of all financial institutions in the UK had their headquarters in, in West Yorkshire. So if we could have, if we could actually create a trans Pennine city, Okay, which encompass Manchester and Leeds. Now, I've got to tell you, I do believe that that would be running against the political grain of the EU, because they are absolutely in favour of, 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 of taking the power to the regions. But that's, that's, going, to, that's going against the market forces in, in what's happening up here. So let's have a redevelopment. Manchester and Leeds, transparency, that is something we could really work for. It would, it would actually allow us to compete with us. That's got interesting, but I don't know what to do with the question. Um, the, the question was about um, uh, other structures besides uh, parties, and should, uh, are people looking at other structures? And I, and I believe yes. I mean, you look at organisations like 38 Degrees, um, who are an online community of people who are working together to influence politicians. They're not a political party, but they come together to try and do positive things and to engage and deal with people that way. One of the things they did was uh, the, uh, the, the Mayfair tax loophole, which gives, which means that uh, private equity firms can uh, get out of paying £700 million worth of tax. They've been in touch with me about uh, some of those issues, in touch with uh, other candidates as well. Uh, and that's, a, a, I think, a very positive organisation. They don't have to be involved with party political structures to do positive things. Uh, and, and I regard that as a good thing. The other organisation I'd uh, draw attention to is the organisation Occupy. Um, who were involved in the, uh, the, the protests outside St Paul's against the city and some of the, the, work, they, the, the work they do. And I, I regard that sort of activity as valid, important and good political activity, like the anti-fracking movements that are out there at the moment and all the, the positive work that they're doing in terms of trying to protect our environment and raise people's uh, consciousness about those issues. So, uh, yes, I think the party structures um, are not the only way that people can actually get involved in politics. And in some, sometimes, actually, there are better ways of getting involved in politics than, than party politics, to be quite honest. Um, so, that's my answer to your question. Well, I, I believe that uh, there are no, obviously no simple solutions to this. I, on the one hand, I do believe in devolution of power. Um, but I do agree, and I've mentioned 38 degrees myself, that. Um, there are all sorts of new ways that people's lives are changing. The, this little machine that we used to call a phone is at the heart of much of the new social uh, action, political action that will take place over coming years. Um, but there's also the one thing I did a, a master's uh, the, the dissertation around, you know, what were the causes of social movement, big social change, when social movements suddenly take off. 
and for you, very often, all the, all the research I found by looking at where social movements come from, nearly always showed the last people to know were institutions and politicians, you know, the formal people, even the academics. It was the poets, it was the people, you know, who were more grassrooted, who were listening to what was the murmurs going on in society. I believe there will be massive social and societal changes over the coming years. And we will then have to react with them, to those and to see if we can you know, take some of the institutions of, of our country, which, come on, let's face it, have taken, you know, they've been you know, pretty good for 250 years. We have been a pretty uh, you know, mobile democracy and a changing democracy. And sometimes we run out of democracy down. You know, one of the finest, mother of parliaments. You know, there's some really good stuff that we have done as a country politically. Yes, we're going to have to modify them. One of them is that we've got to recognise when there are real changes in our society. Why did Huddersfield become the centre of the Industrial Revolution? We had cheap power flowing from the, from the, from the Pennines to turn the water mills. We had high skills we'd learned to you know, catch the sheep, shear the sheep and, and spin and weave. And we also had, out of somewhere, so the water, the woodwork, amazing entrepreneurs that took all that together and made us the center of a new industrial empire that stretched right around the world. But I have to tell you, much of what happened in Britain after that in terms of the power of Yorkshire came from that strength. So you won't be invented by having a Yorkshire regional government. You'll do it by realising that if our country, if, if this part of our country is going to be successful, we've got to invest in innovation, in skills, and in entrepreneurship. And then the power will follow that. So that's what I believe. And a lot of that will come from rascal roots, small people making magnificent changes to create what I started my remarks by, creating a good life for all of us. Thank you. Thanks. Have some a uh, bit of audience participation here. Uh, put your hands up, folks, if you know the name of the Mayor of Kirklees. Please. Okay. <laughs> hands up now if you know the name of the Mayor of London. Go and be honest. Okay, most of you. Look, the point I'm trying to make is... We're in urban centre. Exactly. I go down to London every week on the train, and in fact I was on a London train, going to Brentford to see Huddersfield Town there a couple of weeks ago. The train was incredibly smooth, modern and fantastic. I'm used to pacer trains up here. They shake you so much um, that, that you can't even concentrate on who you're talking to. I go out to London and I see all the investment there, the new buildings, the shard, cranes everywhere, there's Starbucks, that's not a good thing, but there's loads of fantastic things going on. I come back to Yorkshire, there are good things going on, but I want more of it. I want to have a focus, a figurehead, devolved power, so we know someone who is making the big transport decisions up here in Yorkshire on our behalf. Someone who is attracting inward investment, getting huge investment from, from overseas and from within the United Kingdom. I want to transport for Yorkshire, a TFY, and I want to know the name of the person that we can hold responsible when we're on these 40-year-old pacer trains going from my village of Honley over to Sheffield. I think that would be a really, really good thing. I'm a proud Yorkshireman, and I think we can engage with people, Freddie, by having real accountability, knowing who is making decisions on our behalf. And it, it doesn't matter what party they're from, because I think Ken Livingston did a good job as Mayor of London as well. He was the one that actually got the Olympic Games going to London, so well done to him. I would actually put forward, and I was speaking to him last week, Gary Berrett, who brought the Tour de France to Yorkshire, get someone like him that you can unite all our communities, unite education, uh, health, businesses, and get a lot more investment and pride in Yorkshire. Fine words, really fine words. How many people know Alex Salmond? He is not a mayor. The Scottish model is first rate devolution in the context of the United Kingdom. What you've just had there is someone who wants us in Yorkshire to accept not second rate, which would be the Welsh model, not third rate, which would be perhaps the Northern Ireland model, not fourth rate, which is the London model, but effectively fifth rate devolution. For us, first rate devolution, similar to Scotland, that is the aspiration. Anything less 
is a seller to London and will not rebalance our great country. Okay, so you've got 20 seconds to respond to that now, we, uh, if you want to. Um, well, in Parliament, there's loads of campaigns for the Kurnow which is in Cornwall and different parts of the country as well. I want the United Kingdom to stay together. I think we're better together. However, as a proud Yorkshireman who lives here, uh, my only home is here, my only one kitchen is here in Yorkshire. Uh, I, I, I want to get, I want to get, how many kitchens have I got, Barry? How many mansions has David Cameron got? <laughs> how many kitchens have you got, Barry? Six, he said. You've got one kitchen. So you have a home, so anyone can get that. How many you have got mansions? Okay, fair enough. Uh, I want us to have more decision making here. Uh, I want to engage with every aspect of the community. And Freddie, one point, you had a question about how to engage with apathy and young people. Um, I haven't been getting much applause here tonight. Do you know why? Because my 30 supporters, just about all of them younger than me, are out on the doorsteps tonight campaigning hard. And they'll be texting me later saying all the hard work that they've done. And most times when I'm out, all my campaign team are younger than me. And I'm very proud of that, engaging with young people. Well, thank you very much. Time, time has beaten us. We could, we could go on for some time. I'd like to thank.